Thank you, Lucy. Um, we have apologies from Patsy Hunt Williams. Has anybody else got apologies? No? Okay, thank you. Um, disclosure of personal prejudicial interest. Sam? Yeah, I'd uh, just like to declare an interest as a member of the Fire Authority. Uh, okay. Seeing as the Fire Authority are part of the, uh, the yeah. PSB. Okay. Good. Chair, yeah, I mentioned that as well, if I may. Yeah. Who's Linda? Linda, any else? Rebecca? I'm myself, Terry Hennigan, Fire Authority. Rebecca? Um, yeah, a uh, personal interest in the item on how's the multiple occupation as my day job is with Shelter Cymru. Okay. Any, any other declarations of interest? No? Okay. Yeah. Can I ask those of you to unmute yourselves again, please? Okay, so we move on to prohibition of whip votes and declaration of party whips. Okay, and then minutes the last meeting, which on page one, this is for accuracy now, page two, page three, and page four, up and page five. Are people content those are accurate? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I should take that as they consent. Right, we're going to move on to public questions. And I've got Northy Perro online to ask a question. Northy, would you like to ask a question? He seems to be muted. Jay is unmuted. Would you like to ask your question, Northridge? Hello, can you hear me, Northridge? Problems, problems. I can hear you. Hello. Can, uh, can you can you hear me, Northridge? Yeah. Okay, Northridge, we've got your written question in front of you in front of us. So I'm going to ask um, David to answer the question which has been written in front of us, OK? Because I can't, I, obviously you're having trouble get, um, speaking to us. OK, David? Yeah, thanks, sir, Nortridge. What I would say, uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me the uh, question, um, sorry, in, um, in advance. What I would say is the Housing Act 2004 did not do not cover holiday accommodation to short term let, such as Airbnb properties. Housing, housing and health and safety uh, rating system, the method of use into assess risk and to allies across the private se sector do not therefore apply. Landlords with short term lets uh, will have to register the property with rent and watch mails. Um, as a letting agency, do not fall within requirements of the legislation of the um, Housing Wales Act 2014. The Welsh Government are currently um, consulting a proposal, the statutory licensing system for all visitor accommodation uh, prov uh, providers in Wales. The consultation is open until the 17th of March uh, 23, with the proposed new licensing system to, to uh, level up the playing field to improve standards of visitor accommodation in Wales. Obviously, uh, what I will supply is a, a full written response to your question. Um, but uh, I'm quite, quite happy to leave it there and give further information within your the written response. Okay. Thank, you, thank you, David. I think I can add that they are, they are consulting on legislation on Airbnbs, aren't they? So I think that is in the pipeline from the Welsh Government's point of view. OK, is, um, is Mark Rowe online at all? Is he there? No, OK, in that case, um, we'll, we'll have to give him a written response to his questions. 
Yeah. Can I just say, I did, he yeah. did drop me an email last night asking for receipt for that. I give him receipt and also give him a commitment. But I will give him a full written response to the yeah. uh, to the questions supplied. Th thank you for that, David. That's very helpful. OK, we're going to move on to scrutiny of Swansea Public Services Board um, draft local wellbeing plan. Um, can I welcome Councillor Andrea Lewis? Um, is Roger Thomas with us? I think he is. No, Roger, Roger's not with us, is he? OK, we've got Richard Rowlands and Susie Richards online, I understand. So, Andrea, would you like to um, introduce this thing, please? Uh, Chair, if, uh, with your indulgence, uh, if I can hand over first to Richard Rowlands to take us through um, and just give us an overview, and then I'll come through with comments following that. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. We, we, we have read the report and we've looked at the draft. I understand there's an updated version, so maybe you can cost out any changes in between the what we've been seeing and what and what the latest version is, if that's OK. Thank you, Chair. I'll just take you through the report very briefly. So it starts on page 15 of your papers, introduced the work that's been done to develop the draft plan. The first two paragraphs of the report in pages 15 and 16, we describe there the consultation engagement that's been taken on the plan over the, the last few months. The consultation started on the 22nd of November and ended yesterday on the 13th of February, so that's a 12 week consultation period. And before that, there was a statutory 14 week engagement with the Office of the Future Generations Commissioner, which was uh, which was a positive response to the praise the PSB for the collaborative way in which we engaged with them on the development of the plan. Uh, there are a lot of different methods that we've used in terms of the consultation to better engage with and involve um, different stakeholders. There's uh, an on and offline survey face to face government uh, engagement activities which are described in paragraphs 2.1 and 2.2. Uh, that's also included working with the West Glamorgan Your Voice Advocacy to produce the easy read versions of the consultation to make sure that we engaged people with additional learning needs uh, to ensure that they were able to engage with the consultation. We also promoted the consultation as well through partners and their networks, uh, stakeholder groups around people with protected characteristics through the media and through social media and all that's described in paragraphs 2.3 to 2.5. Third paragraph, we have the responses to the consultation at the time of writing this report, which includes at Appendix B, the response from the Office of the Future Generations Commissioner, which I mentioned earlier, uh, which has been fully actioned. And then in paragraph 3.2, we have a summary of the um, Welsh Government's initial interim response, which again was positive, and we've since received on Friday the formal response. So we're going through that now as we speak. And likewise, in paragraph 3.3, we recently received on Friday a formal response from NRW, so we're going through that too. And I believe that we've also received a recent response from the Health Board. The response to the online survey was lower than we would have uh, wanted, and that's despite the uh, considerable efforts that were made uh, to promote the survey, as I just described, and engage with people to try and encourage participation. Uh, but anecdotally, this doesn't seem to be an issue that's confined to Swansea PSB, but perhaps part of a wider consultation fatigue. In paragraph 3.5, we have the initial results from the survey suggesting that there is significant support for the wellbeing objectives and the, described, the steps described in the plan. Perhaps less support for some of the more internally focused steps, such as the one around data development and performance measurement. On page 18 then in paragraph four, uh, we described the changes that have been made to the draft plan during the consultation period, and that includes a summary of the assessment of local wellbeing, some updates to how the wellbeing objectives are defined, some references to commitments that have been made by the PSB partners, updates to the driver diagrams and the description from the impact from the plan on the seven national wellbeing globes and we've also made changes to the steps to achieve the objectives and the actions to deliver them and all that is summarized in paragraphs 4.1 on page 18 to paragraph 4.10 finishing on page 26 and then finally paragraph 5 in page 26 sets out the the next steps which includes finalizing the plan following the end of the consultation getting approval from each of the four statutory partners and then the plan signed off by the Joint Committee on the 27th of April. And then between March and June, we'll be working on the action plans, which will be developed for each objective, as well as developing different and accessible versions of the plan 
ready for the launch in May. And in relation to your um, initial statement there, Chair, in terms of the recent changes on the current version of the plan, if I can just hand you over to Susie, she'll be able to um, update you on that. Thank you. Susie? Oops, absolutely. Um, the recent changes on the plan are 90%, um, uh, well, more than 90% covered in the changes which are in the um, accompanying report that Richard's just run you through. Um, in addition, other minor tweaks um, are being made, um, but don't change the, the overall um, feel or um, uh, direction of the plan in, in any in any way. Um, so yeah, perhaps um, it, would you like me to run through those in detail or perhaps you'd like to go straight to questions? Um, unless there's anything significant, I think we'll go straight to questions, so that's OK. Andrew, do you want to add anything? Uh, yes, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I just say a huge Thank you to Richard Rowlands and Susie. Uh, as, as Richard has outlined, there's been a real concerted effort to do as broad an engagement as we possibly could. Uh, we reached out to so many organisations um, and it's still slightly disappointing that uh, we didn't have uh, perhaps the engagement and the feedback, but that was certainly not through a lack of try-in. Uh, and this has been really focused particularly on this plan. So my thanks to Susie, Richard and the team. Um, I just draw members' attention to 4.2 of the report that the four local wellbeing objectives remain. However, they've been updated in their definitions to be more relevant to where we currently are now. And um, we made the decision as a PSB that the climate change and nature recovery would remain together as an objective because we felt that the both things were intrinsically linked, as I'm sure Councillor Hopkins will agree. Uh, and we sit together on the Climate and Nature Recovery Board, for example, because those two things link so closely. Um, so uh, personally, I think uh, as the chair of the PSB that this plan will have a far more robust way of recording outcomes uh, and measures and additionality um, where which you haven't possibly seen in previous plans. This one is making a concerted effort to focus on one or two particular priorities that the PSB have uh, under those objectives in order that they can be measurable and to make sure that they don't cross over on any other boards because uh, as I'm sure Scrutiny Programme Committee are aware, we've got the RPB, the APB, we've got regional boards. And so we wanted to make sure that the PSB is adding additional value and not any repetition or duplication of anything that's happening elsewhere. So thank you to the team. I'll leave it there, Chair, because I'm sure you want to go to questions. I'll start off then. Um, I mean, I, I think the it's quite a useful document and, and you know as a strategy it's great what i can't actually see is any concrete outcomes i mean how how do we measure what it is you, you are achieving or is there going to be another document setting out specific outcomes with time scales saying we can measure against that or is this is this going to be the, the general tenure of the final document yeah Richard, do you want to have a go at this? Yeah, 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 sure. Thanks, Chair. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're going to be working on uh, detailed action plans that will sit behind the objectives. And part of that will be about um, looking at performance measures and targets, um, which which will be determined when when we are developing and de delivering the action plans to deliver the objectives and the steps within the plan. So we're going to be starting work on that in March and June and then the timelines, the specific timelines and the specific measures and uh, outcomes will follow from that. OK, so um, is there going to be a clearer link between national wellbeing indicators and each of the wellbeing objectives as well? So we can be clear what indicators are driving the plan uh, and proposals? Yeah, so that that's one of the things that we will be yeah. looking at um, when we when we go when we look at that step, you know, in terms of developing the measurement framework. The, the sort of the link between the national indicators and you know the local picture that's something that we will be looking at as part of that work okay so hopefully we'll be able to come back to this in the summer to have a look at the your action plan and start looking at the outcomes and how we can measure those as part of that okay that's great uh, chris holly 
Chris, you want to unmute yourself? Chris, you're muted. Is it just me today? <laughs> Yeah, Chris, Chris, you're, you're muted, Chris. Can you hear? Can you hear me, Christopher? Can you hear me, Chris? Sorry, yes. Yeah. Would, you, would you like to ask you a question? Sorry, I, uh, I'm miles away then. Um, yeah. yeah, have you got it written down for you? Yes. Can you read it out for me, please? Because <laughs> I haven't got it written down. Um, you're, you're asking about the resources needed to deliver oh, yes. the plan yeah. and how, how that's going to be quantified based on the draft plan to achieve the objectives. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. OK, Richard, do you want to look at that? Yeah, sure. I sure. Apologize. Uh, th thank you. Thank you, Councillor. So um, there is no there is no dedicated budget for the delivery of the of the wellbeing plan. Um, that has to be done within the existing budget envelope for the council. However, there is there is a close synergy between the um, the council's budget um, and the priorities of the council and the um, objectives within the PSB wellbeing plan, as well as the steps to deliver them as well. So, um, for example, we, we have a budget um, uh, as part of the council's budget in terms of the achievement of the net zero target by 2030, uh, which is included within the, the PSB wellbeing plan. And, and uh, another example would be the human rights city again, that is something which is also budgeted in terms of the council. So there is a close alignment and synergy between um, the the wellbeing plan and uh, the and the forthcoming corporate plan of the council. Um, so there would be a budget there to deliver those things, and we'd be doing that um, in in tandem. So it, it, the wellbeing plan will be linked into the develop of the uh, wellbeing plan. How does that work? So the corporate plan, the forthcoming corporate plan um, has been developed uh, along a similar timeline to the to, to the wellbeing plan. So there is a close synergy between the, the wellbeing objectives of the council and the wellbeing objectives of the PSB. So the resources, there is a close link between the resources required to deliver both because we've ensured that there is that strategic link between the two plans. Okay. So, yes. on, sorry, sorry uh, Councillor Holly, sorry. if I can um, add to that as well, um, this isn't just in terms of the wellbeing objectives, this isn't just the council's plan and the council's wellbeing plan. This is a plan which belongs to all the statutory partners on the public service board. And so this is also about doing things within our existing budgets and doing them collaboratively and, and working differently. Uh, and so it doesn't necessarily require a pot of money to make change. Um, what we could do is look at what we do and try to do it differently. And I, I could see Martin from NRW has come in on that as well, uh, Chair. So perhaps over to Martin. Uh, this is a really important point. Uh, thanks for your question, Chris. Just to echo uh, Andreas, the Chair's comments there and Richard's there, and add a third dimension to it really. NRW is, is itself developing its corporate plan, our corporate plan. Now we've got three wellbeing objectives in it, and all of, all of the public bodies are required to have wellbeing objectives with the intention of them aligning. So here we are. I mean, our wellbeing objectives are the nature emergency, the climate emergency, and pollution prevention, with a really strong wash or thread of social justice across there. So we're trying to deliver for social justice. We're also taking account of our area statements that we're required to publish as well, which have informed the Swansea wellbeing plan for the second time now. So we will be putting resources into our corporate plan delivery which will deliver things in Swansea, we'll be making sure that that corporate plan aligns with the objectives of the wellbeing plan in Swansea too. So this alignment and synergy in theory happens as does the alignment of budgets that are already there. And the idea of the wellbeing plans and um, public service boards in 
than initially was to sweat that Welsh pound more. You'll hear, you'll have heard Roderick Morgan talk about that and to get that added value from the existing money that's already there, given the pressures on the public purse. So we're trying to do that, all of us. So it's great to hear that question and be able to answer it. The thing I think, I think the, the, what I'm getting at is we need to see examples of when our NRW and the, all our other partners in the wellbeing plan actually uh, align. Because one of the things that, you know, going back many, many years when we've started doing this process, well before the, the, the you know the, the well-being plans that you have now uh, we asked the question about what is what what are you actually doing to that improves the lives of the people of of swansea south wales etc and went to the examples and i think that's one of the things that we'd ask now okay if you haven't got the budgets for it so what part of that golden thread through all of these um, well, BM plans, corporate plans, etc. What links them all, and what are the advantages for the general public? And I think that's the question that comes from this, from 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 all these various questions. Richard, do you want to? Well, yep. Um, so, so yeah, the Susie. the link. So, so the link link between them are the the well-being objectives between the different plans. Uh, as part of the work that we've done on our plans is to ensure that that they are aligned and that the steps to deliver those objectives are aligned as well. So that that goes to the point that Martin was just talking about. Um, and then the budgets of all our individual budgets are aligned to our plans so that we, you know, we have collectively the resources to deliver them. And then in terms of demonstrating, um, you know, the, the difference that's that's going to make, well, then that goes back to the question of how we demonstrate that through our reports and through our performance uh, frameworks. You know which we've which we've set out that we're going to de to develop looking forward in terms of this particular plan so so richard are the corporate plans of all the constituent members of the the service board going to be aligned with your your plan as well and will the action plan include actions for some of those people as well yeah, so so all all the uh, the bodies involved in the in the public service board, all their corporate plans should align to the to the PSB yeah. wellbeing plan. Certainly, ours does in terms of the forthcoming corporate plan, and uh, the steps to deliver those um, objectives. Um, there will be commonalities between us as well, but the PSB wellbeing plan gives us that space where we can bring those things together. And, and when you produce your action plan in the summer, there'll be actions there for the health board, for NRW, as well as as well as Swansea Council. Um, yeah, and I mean, fire authority, sure. police. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can't can't prejudge the work in terms of the action plan, but you know, everybody collaborating and working together, I think, is the key going forward. Okay, okay. Thank you. Right. Um, if are you finished, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thanks very much, all. Yeah. Uh, cast the mic, White. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah. Th thanks, Chair. Uh, I could be fair. What a re really enjoyable document to read through and talk through. Very, very interesting. Um, can I just ask you then in regards to the the four steps towards achievement of objectives with reference to steps that underpin the entire suite of objectives and sub steps that will set out how we will implement the steps to achieve objectives can you clarify in appendix one making the connections page 26 of the document which is meant to show the role of each objective and carry out the steps the piece this appears to be plus not and not complete plus incomplete because under the fourth um, objective, the stronger communities, communities it got it's, it's listed as non applicable and and also the others are to be confirmed. Can you clear? I know whether you, you mentioned another document, whether this has now been updated. If you can just say, like, then up, please, Richard. Yes, so yeah, yeah. Nick, I'm and, sorry, and, yes. Andrea, Andrea is a volunteer to start off the answer to that, Richard. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'm happy um, if Susie or Richard want to come in on this, but just to give some reassurance to Councillor White that this was an early iteration of the plan um, and it has changed several times and that correction has been made. Um, so we will be allocating leads to each objective uh, and I'm, I'm sure Susie or Richard might want to come in and elaborate further on that. 
Yeah, just just to say, uh, Chair, that um, within the report itself, in paragraph 4.9 on page 24, the details has been included in there, and that will be included in the final draft of the plan as well. Has anyone got any more questions on this plan at all? No, it is going to be come back to. Oh, hang on, Rebecca. I've just seen Rebecca. Yeah, Rebecca Fogarty. Yeah, a lot of questions in which was a comment. Um, I just wanted to echo what Councillor Lewis said about the ma mass amount of effort that must have gone into the engagement um, side of things. I uh, was at one of those events representing as Vice Chair of Rumble's Community Council, so I'd been invited in that role and I thought the events were really well put together and it was a bit of a shame not to have more people there because they were so enjoyable and, um, and really good events. And I really welcome the reference in the report as well to closer working with town and community councils because I think that will be really valuable going forward. Richard? Yeah, I just wanted to say, Chair, that uh, I can't take too much credit for it. Uh, most of the work on this plan has done, be done by Susie and by supported by Leanne within my team as well. So I just want to pass my thanks on to them personally. OK, I, I think we'll all pass on our thanks to Susie and Leanne for the work they've done, which is obviously huge, and especially in the consultation. Unless there's any more questions on this report. Linden. Oh, Lyndon, how? Lyndon, hello, Lyndon. Go on. Hi. <laughs> uh, what I was going to ask, actually, when you mentioned the public consultation really and meeting. engagement, how many people, how many responses did you actually get? Uh, because you mentioned in the inter in the initial results, uh, sorry, the uh, the interim results suggest uh, an overwhelming support for the objectives, but how many people did actually uh, respond? Susie, do you want to do that? Uh, overall, the uh, results haven't been reported to the PSB yet, and we're still crunching that data. However, um, it hasn't increased substantially, and the uh, analysis to date hasn't changed um, any of the um, the uh, the status which which has been reported to date in terms of as I say, the um, uh, well-being objectives being supported overwhelmingly and support being there for each of the steps. Um, yeah, what, so, what sort of number? Uh, at the moment, we'd be looking at, it was 115 last time we looked at it. We're looking at somewhere between 115 and 130. Um, I don't want to give a specific figure because that hasn't mm. been signed off by um, consultation. We get doubles and, and things like that that we have to uh, verify before uh, pu publishing. But we're doing that work as at the moment right now. And uh, that that's uh, looking a very small increase since last week. Yeah. Yeah, let, let's Andrea come in first, Linda. Yeah, sorry, uh, Councillor Jones, if I could just um, come in as well on uh, from what Susie said. So I think um, we do need to be mindful, not just of the submissions to the consultation, but actually the number of people who've been engaged with throughout this process. So it, they're not necessarily um, giving a submission, but they have been talked through the wellbeing plan uh, and that is people like the Tackle Poverty Forum, 50 plus network council, uh, community and town councils. There's been a huge raft of engagement. So just be uh, just be mindful not to focus too much on the low responses because actually the engagement's been far and wide as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Lyndon, do you want to come back? Uh, you know, just obviously disappointed with the direct responses, um, as as I think Richard mentioned as well, and 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 Susie, and and but you know when we talk about overwhelming support, then really even with those groups, we're not really talking about many people. So I think, um, you know, that might be a bit wide off the mark. Oh, sorry, I was only speaking in relation to the consultation, the online consultation results. In terms of support for the wellbeing objectives and the hundreds of ideas that we received beyond that that was recorded through formal electronic consultation, which we've captured in a spreadsheet and done a similar analysis of, um, that again is more qualitative, but again, absolutely overwhelmingly um, supportive, uh, very little um, you know, divergence from the, the direction which we've set out. So I'm absolutely confident that that is the case and we've got the data to uh, support it at a granular level. 
OK. Is, is there anybody else wants to ask the question? Yeah, Andrea, yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair of the, the Intelligence, for just one more quick no, thing. Um, I, I have spoken recently with Susie, and we will be producing an easy read version as well. Uh, and so, you know, obviously we're mindful that the plan is quite hefty and quite detailed. And so we want to make sure that we reach as many people as we can and that it's, it's relative and uh, that, you know, it, people find it easy to cover the, the headlines, really. So that will be produced as well. I, I would have thought you were going to get a more response it's once you have a, a concrete action plan so people can then respond to particular objectives which can be measured and, and see where that, that's where you start dividing opinion, I suspect, uh, on that particular point. So that, that would be the interesting time, maybe. Anybody else want to come in on this before I close this and move on to the next item? I'm going to give you 30 seconds, a few seconds. No? OK, thank you very much indeed, Andrea, and your team and, and for the work you've done on this and for responding. Hopefully we'll be able to have a, a chase up in the summer when we'll be able to look at the action plan and, and, uh, and start to ask questions around that as well. So thank you very much indeed for that. Lovely. Right, item seven is the scrutiny of the Cabinet Member Portfolio Responsibilities on Houses and Multiple Occupation. Can I welcome Councillor David Hopkins, who's the Cabinet Member for Corporate Service and Performance. I understand, David, you have Carol Morgan, Head of Housing and Public Health, Paula Livingston, Divisional Environmental Health Officer, Alice Marks and Peter Brace, who are both Senior Environmental Health Officers, Tom Evans from Placemaking Strategic Planning Manager, and Ian Davis, the Development Manager. So uh, welcome, everybody. Um, who would like to introduce your report? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Councillor Black. Uh, before I start introducing the report, I'm quite conscious that um, Mr. Rowe have missed public question time. So what I will give a commitment to do at this particular time is to set a meeting up with Mr. Rowe and the relevant officers uh, as soon as I possibly can and diarise that as a matter of urgency so we can sit down and discuss that in, in, in the mindfulness of being openness and transparent. So I will give that commitment at this particular stage going forward. I think that'd be very helpful, thank you. So yeah. I, will, I will do that and, not, and also will supply a written, supply, written thing, but I would prefer to speak to you if I could with my officer. So if I move on to, to the report, don't intend to go through it in any depth, but what I would say, I think we need to be quite mindful of, of um, where we've been, particularly with the pandemic and where our office has been, um, you know, in the pandemic, looking at nursing homes, look, looking to try to, you know, what they do, what they were trained to do, is, which is infection control. They've been playing an integral uh, role within this council and in protecting public and and helping us as a council to move forward. So, first thing, my thanks to Paula Livingstone, particularly for bringing this report to us today and giving the meat to the uh, on the bones. This is pre predominantly concentrating on the uh, licensing issues, but I have suggested planning come forward in case we do stray into the planning regulations. The purpose of the report, obviously our purpose of our department is to try to get standards increased within within the, the supply chain of HMOs. What I wouldn't want to focus on today is the, you know, the, the, the is, is just students looking at HMOs. There are lots more people going to be using HMOs going forward, particularly with the crisis the way it is. So. I'm quite happy to be quite open with you today and say, yes, we have got a backlog, particularly with licensing. We are aiming to get that like, that backlog um, aiming. I use that word aiming quite clearly to get that back, backlog under control by May uh, this year. Um, there have been several factors associated with that with the staffing. We now are fully complemented or nearly fully complemented with staff. We had problem recruiting. But we seem to be in that um, position now moving forward. So I'm not going to go through the report other than to um, ask well, any questions. I know there are several questions, but I'm happy to take further questions and go through the report. I don't know whether you want, want Paula to go through the report first. Paula, well, do you want to add anything to the report? Not, not at this stage. I think it's probably more appropriate if there are questions, okay. Chair, then we can um, direct, the, direct the responses. That's fine. Um, Right, Councillor Mike White, you've got a question, haven't you? Yes, thank you, Chair. I think within the the the, uh, the, the uh, introduction that Councillor Hopkins has given is more or less a, more or less touched on my question and what I wanted to ask. So I think you know more or less I've more or less been given, been sort of been given the answer there. But uh, if you'd like me to ask it, I'm more than happy to ask it. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Yeah, it's in relation to the current performance trends, licensing of properties. 
in reference to section six, paragraph 6.4, 6.5, page 99. As you pointed out, Cabinet member, the, the, because of the pandemic, lots of staff were redeployed into other areas to support uh, social services and other areas of the local authority. Uh, uh, but what I really wanted to ask really is, um, now that the staff are back, you said obviously the team are all together, um, that that the uh, that the that the that the uh, back backlogs are, are being checked up, uh, are, are being followed up. Okay, Paula. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, Councillor White, as you've pointed out in um, paragraph six point four and six point five, sort of outlines some of the some of the situation that we've been in during the pandemic, and um, as the cabinet members pointed out. Um, quite a few of the officers in the team are actually professionally qualified environmental health officers. So we were um, all of us then were drafted into the, the regional test race protect um, team dealing with um, regulations and the situation that we were in during the pandemic, advising businesses and, and taking enforcement action. Um, that situation has been reverted now, so I have got all but one person back into the team. I mentioned in the report that somebody has been on maternity leave, but she will be returning after Easter. Um, we had severe backlog. I think it's it's fair to say that because of the um, restrictions that were placed on us for being able to go out and about. Obviously, that impacts on a lot of people. But as part of the inspection process, obviously, we're going into residential properties quite often occupied by uh, a number of people who are not even known to each other. They're not always cohesive groups. And so the risks were much higher at the time for officers going in and doing their ordinary inspections. So we've been trying to do catch up. Um, as the cabinet member mentioned, the backlog on the licenses that were issued without inspection is what we're aiming to catch up on by May. But I would conservatively with a small c estimate probably that it could well take another 18 months to 24 months before we are without the delays that we've got at the moment in processing applications. So in the report mentioned that during the pandemic um, when somebody submitted an HMO license application to us it was maybe taking six months before we were able to respond to that. We're currently down to four months. It's still a way off where we want to be and where we were before the pandemic, but we are seeing that delay reducing. And I think I mentioned as well that we've got just over 200 license applications at the moment that are um, being processed. Um, so either the applications have been checked or they're then waiting for the inspection to be carried out. Um, and that's just on the licensing side. So I think the report relates or refers back to the huge amount of licensing work that we've got, but also work that we do with HMOs that aren't actually licensable as well. Um, we've had yeah, some staff in vacancies, but again, um, as cabinet members mentioned, we are we are back where we need to be with that. OK, Mike. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And as I say, you know, it, it must be horrendous for, you know, especially those last sort of three years for staff to uh, actually go to and 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 uh, pitch in and, and and help out in those areas of need. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you. I, I think thinking about this, that there's, this this maybe causes quite a lot of confusion with the public. It certainly does with me because there are, as I understand it, three different regimes applying to these these. Um, properties. You've got the HMO licensing regime, which applies to certain types of properties and to certain wards. You've got the um, rent smart wells, which applies to all licensed or all rented properties. And then you've got the planning regulations, which is basically any HMO with three or more um, people in it. But actually, th then most of the loss is not necessarily going to be licensed as a HMO. So that does cause a lot of confusion. And um, how does your enforcement powers sort of deal with that? Because obviously you're looking at the ones which are licensable, licensable but do you get pulled in where there are um, HMOs which um, are not don't need to be licensed, but which um, have got planning permission for HMOs or, or just through rent smart wells outside that licensed um, regime? Conf confusion with a capital C is yeah. uh, is a used on a regular basis because we're dealing with um, 
different pieces of legislation. Um, when we're talking about planning something completely separate and obviously Ian and Tom will be able to mm. to cover those aspects. Um, the two bits of legislation between the planning and the, the housing legislation, the different pieces we've got are not, they're not mandatorily linked at all. Um, in terms of Rent Smart Wales, if the members of the committee, I know Chair that you're um, well aware of what that means, but perhaps I'm not sure if, if other members of the committee are. So that's um, mandatory registration for all um, rental properties with some exceptions, but generally yeah. all rental properties across Wales. Um, and that's then licensing on top of that for anybody who's um, involved in the day to day letting or management arrangements of a, of a residential rental property. So the licensing and the registration is dealt with by Rent Smart Wales, which is a single licensing authority for Wales um, hosted by Cardiff Council. So whilst each of the 22 local authorities has got some enforcement powers related to registration, that's not directly linked to HMOs. That could be one person yeah. renting a, a, you know, a farmhouse cottage or something like that that's maybe been there for 40 years. Never, never been an HMO, never needed to be, but still regulated um, with regards to how that property is managed. So not about conditions in that way. Um, as the cabinet mentioned, cabinet member mentioned, the housing, health and safety rating system um, is what applies about conditions across all tenure, um, not just HMOs. With HMOs, we've got sorry, but with HMOs, we've got the ones that aren't licensable, perhaps never needed planning consent, have been HMOs for a long time. Um, could be anywhere in Swansea in any ward at all, and then we've got the ones that are licensable as well. So different requirements, different definitions, different levels of enforcement, different pieces of legislation. Um, yeah, it's yeah. confusing. So we try to explain that to members of the public. Um, it's it's I appreciate it's hard for some people to understand, and that's probably why we get a lot of inquiries as well. Yeah. So Ian and Tom, um, when you come to make an assessment in terms of planning, um, how do you make an assessment as to what HMOs are in a particular area, given that some of them may not be licensed as HMOs, they may be rented, but you, you have to go and visit to look at those or is, what, what so do you actually do on that? When we have a planning application, we look at what evidence is available. Yeah. So it'll be planning records, um, it'll be licensing records, uh, it may be comments that come in as part of the application process from local residents who identify properties and, and we'll check the history. but. There's possibly going to be occasions where we're not aware of properties and because we're not aware of them, we can't take them into account in um, in the threshold sort of calculations. Yeah. But in, in the areas where you're most likely to get HMOs, which are the ones which are licensable wards, it's going to be much easier there, is it? Because they have to be licensed. There's more information available, yes. Yeah. So yeah, there's more evidence for us to uh, assess the, the concentration. OK, thank you. Um, Terry, Terry Hennigan. Okay. Do you there? Yes. A um, couple, couple of quick ones. Um, I think you know who is uh, um, actually uh, funding. What kind of resources are you having, and where's it coming from? You know, to carry out all this work. Thanks. <laughs> Um, uh, and have we, have we had any problem identifying some of the landlords of these properties? Okay, okay, so um, feedback. Do you want to mute, yeah, mute yourself for the answer, Terry, so we don't get feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, two two ways the the um, team is funded for licensable properties. The local authority is able to set an HMO license fee, um, and we do. Um, quite clearly, we, we wouldn't be able to do this work if it wasn't for the, the license fee. I was just going to say, how much is that these days? Um, 20 years in Felicia. Oh, is it? Okay. Um, that's prescribed 
um, sorry, the, the way that the fee is calculated is prescribed by legislation. The fee itself isn't prescribed by legislation, but that can be only be set on a cost recovery basis for work related directly to licensing. Um, so that's due for review for the forthcoming financial year. Um, but for the a lot of the queries that we get or the work that we do with non licensable um, HMOs that comes out of our ordinary revenue budget. So um, that's money that comes to the team in, in the, the regular budget every year. Um, the second question about identifying landlords. Um, generally, we don't have a problem. Obviously, sometimes there are some landlords who we have never had to deal with the council in the past. Um, the property might have been rented for many years. It didn't need um, planning consent. It's not in the license area. Um, there have never been any complaints from a tenant or from a neighbour about the property. So we, we use the normal things like land registry um, checks. We ask neighbours, we can consult with council tax. We can look at the public register from RentSmart Wales. So we don't generally have a problem. Um, on occasion we do, and that can be quite a lengthy process to try to determine who the relevant person is. And sometimes there are situations where the owner of a property might have a lease arrangement with a third party to actually act um, as a letting agent or a manager of a property. So then it can be complicated. Um, there have been situations that have been reported nationally recently about properties being sold from under the owner's noses and issues with land registry about that. So it can be a complicated process, but it's it's not a, a major problem for us, Chair. Terry, do you want a question on health and safety? You have to unmute yourself now. Can I just go back to the landlord issue? Because um, especially we're letting uh, agents, I've done a lot of work in the private sector. And is it right now that sometimes you can't identify the landlord, but you can identify the letting agent? And I believe the legislation states that you can actually uh, challenge them as you would a landlord. Um, so landlords, with regards to landlords, um, sorry, with regards to HMOs, landlords and agents have different responsibilities under the Housing Act. Mm -hmm. So the local authority is able to take action with both, but not necessarily for the same things. Um, when we're talking in licensing terms, um, there are offences that might be might be committed by both a landlord and an agent, but they're for different, different things. Thing. Um, if perhaps I'm not sure, councillor, whether you refer, are you referring to property condition or? I've had issues where tenants have approached us and when we've gone to try to identify the landlord, we've had severe problems there. In fact, we haven't just done a road and bought a wood for good. They, they own the land, um, but trying to get them to actually look after that piece of land has been unbelievable. I know that's slightly off what we, we talk about with the houses, but I've come across quite a few people who uh, have had trouble, you know, tenants themselves sometimes identifying um, the landlords. And the first thing I ask them is, which way do you pay your rent? Are you paying it direct to the landlord? And then you go to the housing benefit. And as you said, other agencies as well. It's just an issue that has often come up um, in my past work. So apart from that, I'm OK. okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I appreciate it. It's a bit clearer. Thank you, Councillor, in, in what you were particularly referring to. Yeah, um, it can be that there are situations where people have sublet as well, and then that makes um, arrangements confusing if there is enforcement action to be taken. Um, if somebody's let, as I mentioned, there's an arrangement with a third party so that the landlord is sometimes removed um, and there's somebody in, in the middle there. But if needs be and if it's relevant and possible, we can take action with more than one person 
about an issue, particularly about property condition. Um, so sometimes we end up doing that in effect to try to flush out who the relevant person is. And in the most extreme cases, that will be argued out in court. OK, Terry. Fair with that, yes, thank you very much. Uh, you've got another question of you on health on the um, the health and safety on on the new the new legislation. Yeah, you know it's early days yet, but um, again, you know, who will be actually checking or inspecting these properties? Will it be involved in the fire authority and people like that? This is relation to the renting homes act, which okay. came into force yeah. in December. Yeah. Yeah. So when we're talking about the renting homes act again, if um, maybe not all the committee members are aware, but new piece of legislation that came into force in Wales on the 1st of December. And that piece of legislation is not enforceable by local authorities. That relates directly to the um, contractual arrangements between landlords and their tenants who are now called contract holders. So again, talked about confusion before, but there's a whole new language to get used to. Um, and terminology. So with that, that's not a case of local authority regulators inspecting premises. That's um, opportunities for landlords and their tenants. Let's use the old money that we used to the contract holders themselves and what the arrangements are between them. That doesn't provide any additional or new enforcement powers for the local authority. Haven't there been some changes to the, the health and safety ratings, um, particularly in terms of um, smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors, that sort okay, of thing? OK, so so again, that's for the individual landlord now as part of their right. contractual terms about what they have got to be provided in a property. But it, it's not for the local authority to enforce that. Right. Um, so you may have heard of the fitness for human habitation, yeah. which is a a term that those of us are old enough to remember the, the enforcement powers that the local authority used to have um, in, in under the 1985 Housing Act relating to the condition of the property. Um, that's not made a change to the HHSRS, so the, the methodology which the local authority uses for enforcement. It's a change in the contractual terms between a landlord and the contract holder, so the tenant, um, a property, a landlord does have to provide more things in the property now, like you mentioned about um, carbon monoxide detectors yeah. for one thing, providing five yearly as a max electrical yeah. condition reports. That's a private um, issue between the two parties, not for the local That's, that's not part of the HHRS at all. That's no. ridiculous. So, so when, when you go to inspect, when you carry out inspections of HMOs, you, you don't even look for that. You, you, can you look for that? Can you raise that issue? So the contractual terms between the landlord and the, and the contract yeah. holder, we will not intervene with. It's not yeah. the local authority's role in doing that. Yeah. What we do when we're inspecting HMOs is that we continue to use HHSRS in all HMOs. Um, management um, regulations in all HMOs in all. Um, and then the license conditions with regards to licensable HMOs. But the terms between the contract holder and the landlord is not, not an issue that the local authority can intervene with. So what remedies does the tenants have? Could the tenant, for example, go to Rent Smart Wales and say the landlord is not meeting obligations, can you remove their licence? Two, two things. Yeah. So um, as has always been the case, yes, if a, if a tenant thought that um, their landlord wasn't complying with the terms of their Rent Smart Wales landlord licence or the agent, they can contact Rent Smart Wales and ask for them to investigate, you know, mm. to provide information. But also under the new legislation, under the Renting Homes Act, um, the tenant themselves, the contract holder, has um, options now to withhold rental payments under certain circumstances and could seek to take the landlord to court mm. if they failed to uh, if they thought that the property was not fit for human habitation. 
and that would be for the court to determine whether that was the case. So that's completely private, not involving. But most tenants won't have those resources, of course. Correct. Yeah. So yeah. Shelter Cymru, um, yeah. we've, we've been working with Shelter Cymru. Shelter Cymru are expecting more people coming through the doors. Yeah. And what sort of it? And are, are the tenants being made aware of their rights? How's that? Is that being through us or Smart Wales or? Um, Rent Smart Wales have been doing some work where they can, although yeah. they don't hold information. You know, te tenants are in the private rent sector and notoriously difficult to contact because they're not a cohesive group yeah. in any way. Um, Politicians but, through, as well. <laughs> but I was just going to say Welsh Government have been trying to get information out there. Citizens Advice Bureaus um, have been trying to get information out. We've changed the information that we give when so when we receive complaints about property condition, um, we tenants now have an, a legal obligation to contact the landlord before we can intervene. So we're trying to explain that to them as well. OK, thank you. Terry, do you have any other questions? I hope that doesn't affect the, you know, the same way with council tenants and, and the landlord the city council Swansea. I know we talk on the private sector, but you know um, that seems like a lot, very, very complicated to me. Yeah, I think so that's the same legislation. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. the it's a whole raft of legislation that um, colleagues within the the landlord services area um, of the local authority have been working on this for months and months and months because yeah. it's a huge piece of work that does also impact upon. Um, yeah. the council as a landlord and their relationship with um, the council's tenants or as they're now called contract holders a uh, huge piece of legislation that colleagues have been working through yes yeah, from my memory it doesn't actually distinguish between public sector and private sector tenants so it does affect our our, our contract holders <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah. ridiculous name okay. okay terry thank you very much thank you anybody else got any questions on this item peter may yeah. Thank you very much, Chair. A uh, few few questions, either answer them, probably one at a time. First of all, can I um, convey my thanks to the HMO licensing team for the work that they've done under you know, pressing conditions? I know you were uh, taken off off the off the game during the pandemic, and of course, everything is a is is a catch up on there. Um, also, pay pay credit to the the response on not um, on, on general sort of um, licensing queries with you know where we've where we've got the old queries there. In fact, I was dealing with Paula today on one, and the response and turnaround is always first class, and um, you know the service provided is is very good. And thank you to Alice as well on that. Right, okay, the. Um, Going, going on, the, the first one's a little uh, uh, planning one. We've had the, obviously, we've had the um, LDP in in force for a while now, so little little bits have have been going. Them, a couple of things that have have been um, pick, picked up from that are when you've got um, obviously the, the percentage is worked out by taking a numerator, that's the number of HROs, and a denominator, which is the total number of properties within the 50 meter radius. Now. There have been a couple of ap applications where the um, percentage has been artificially lowered because you've got a, a block of flats in the vicinity or you've got a house which has been compartmentalised into flats or rooms. I could bring an instant case of Eaton Crescent where you've got one house which has compartmentalised into seven rooms which became seven separate properties even though it was only one house. So that artificially lowered the percentage um, for, for uh, the terms of the application and allowed the application to go through. There was another one quite early on where you had um, T. Sivertson was nearby to the or, or within the, the 50 metre radius. And of course, that is a, a dwelling or a unit of 23 or so flats, I think, or 21, I don't know. But that had the, the impact then of actually putting a huge number on the denominator, percentage comes down um, and that goes through. Is there any scope? It, it is an anomaly in the policy. Is there any scope to having a, a look at that? Uh, because when you've got um, an individual property that's been compartmentalised, it can adversely let applications through. Uh, the second point. Should we answer that question first? And then yeah, we'll come back. certainly. Yeah. 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 yeah, Tom. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thanks, Chair. 
Thank you for the for, for the, the question. I think what it does is that question is 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 tease out this again this difference between the legislation on the planning side and the licensing side and fundamentally with the planning applications we deal with the use class order and the categorization of properties uh, in accordance with the Planning Act. So when we're looking at those planning applications that deal with uh, HMOs, we will, as you say, as a result of the uh, the policy that puts a restriction on the total number or the sort of ceiling of HMO properties within, within an area, we'll we'll look at well what are the what is the overall number of properties and what's the the the, the number of uh, uh, HMO properties as that fall under that, uh, that specific planning categorization then um, and that use class uh, for that uh, uh, particular area. Now there are going to be some instances as you've highlighted there where the nature of the the properties in the area uh, mean that it, 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 it you don't end up with a sort of uh, a percentage in the same way as it would be if it was all, uh, let's say, terrace dwellings in an area, uh, as compared to uh, uh, an area that happens to have a lot of uh, a lot of flats. If if there is a lot of flats in that area, notwithstanding the fact that a uh, percentage is going to sort of come out the other end of that calculation, that is just one element of the assessment that a planning officer will do when it comes to an individual application. So as well as looking at the the outcome of that sort of assessment purely on the sort of uh, percentage wise and the um, the numbers involved, th that officer will look at well, what are the potential impacts of this application? If as a result of, for example, there being uh, a lot of flats in an area and it is causing a lot of pressure on parking facilities in the area. You know, this is a hypothetical uh, situation, but um, if that was happening, then notwithstanding that sort of number that's going to come out the other end of um, of a concentration analysis, uh, it, you know, if, if if that is a significant issue, that could be uh, uh, certainly material to the assessment of the application and, and could be the deciding factor if there is clear evidence that that is the significant uh, concern in, in the area. So um, I think that's one thing, important thing to bear in mind when it comes to our approach as planning officers to these sorts of applications. You know, we do have a policy framework that is, uh, you know, very purposefully looked at this uh, uh, key issue of overall concentration levels in an area, but it is it's, it's one element in the overall assessment of an impact of a uh, of an application because that's what we're concerned with at the end of the day. I think we all are. We're, we're looking at uh, you know what are the effects of a planning application on all sorts of things, on levels of amenity, on impacts on parking, um, standards of living, uh, what, what, whatever it is. Uh, and the overall sort of concentration is is one element of that assessment that um, that will be that will be done. Just don't want to come back on that. In in that case, have you got any examples where the concentration has come out low, where there has been the material example of say parking and that, where that has actually caused the percentage threshold to be overridden? Um, you don't have to provide me with it now, but if you have an example where what you say has happened, um, we're quite happy for that to you know to come across. Yeah, I mean, as I said, that's, it, it's a sort of theoretical example, but there, there may well be examples, and 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 if there are, we can we can forward you the the details of the of the case. Thank you very much. On to on to my uh, next point. Um, there was um, a, uh, a, a clause in the in the LDP about the what was called the six month rule, and that was where if they if a, a property uh, was unsuccessfully marketed as a family home um, over a period of six months at a reasonable market price, it could then 
actually um, circumvent the um, bits of the bits of the policy and um, such as percentage threshold and then apply for HMO status on that basis um, on the grounds that the balance between having an empty property uh, compared to you know an HMO the empty property was more of the evil. Um, it, uh, I think, I, I think there was a house in Montpellier Terrace and possibly one in Cambridge Street, which actually took advantage of this. And I think the Montpellier Terrace one um, fell down on appeal too, um, and did go for, um, didn't even get leave for, for judicial review. Do we still think that um, six months is a reasonable? Uh, time because um, I know perfectly domestic transactions which don't involve HMOs in real life where it's sometimes it is difficult to sell a house over six months isn't long enough to sell a house in normal situations. Um, would there be a consideration to extending this six month rule in the future say at the next review to possibly you know um, uh, a year or something like that? I mean, what, what I would highlight is that that sort of stipulation of six months is not something that's defined in the policy itself, uh, adopted policy. That is something that's uh, been written into guidance as just to, uh, to provide an indication, really, of the sorts of things that will be considered by the decision maker. Um, so it does provide provide that sort of uh, guidance in some instances, you know, it is if, if the condition of the property is so bad and it is assessed as being so unsuitable for a for a, uh, a, a sort of a, a non HMO use, then if you will, then it might be less than that. If if we think there's perfectly good, good, good reason why that could come forward as a family home, it could it could be longer. So I think really when this stuff is put into guidance, it, it's there um, because it's useful to the decision maker to say, well, this is the sort of ballpark where uh, we're, we're, we're talking about in terms of what is a reasonable period. But um, it's guidance that can that can be um, uh, could be longer, could be could be a bit shorter. Thank you very much for your answer. Um, going to 3.4 on the report. Um, <clears throat> when uh, something that um, has been observed, we're possibly dealing with applications of uh, new planning applications for fresh HMOs, properties that possibly weren't HMOs in the past that, that are going. Um, a trend now, obviously, when you've got um, an area of high concentration, such as in particular areas in the Uplands and Newcastle wards, um, it is possible to submit a planning application to increase the numbers of an existing HMOs. So the percentage rule wouldn't wouldn't apply on that. So we've had applications where the HMO has already been at six and an application has gone into up it to seven or to eight. Um, because the the it's it's already an HMO and, and and part of the makeup that obviously doesn't it doesn't count to the percentage. Um, what sort of considerations are are taking when looking at an application like that? Because although it circumvents the the percentage, do we, for example, look on the size and extent? Because if you're going to be putting another um, room or rooms or occupants into the same property, then an extension might be involved. So does the planning department take into account the impact that the extension uh, visual amenity or, or something like that has? Yes, you're right enough when it's already a HMO, it's not going to impact on the concentration. So effectively, that wouldn't uh, be a reason to refuse the application. But we would look at if they're extending the property, what's the impact of that extension? How does it fit in with the existing property? What amenity space is left for future occupiers of the HMO? Uh, what impacts does it have on adjoining property? Uh, so there would be standard planning considerations. We'd also consider impacts uh, on things like parking. So additional occupiers would increase. Uh, once you go over six, you, you, you're looking at an increased um, parking demand and, and provision required. So is any parking being provided off street? If not, what are the impacts on highway safety? Um, so they, they would all be standard planning issues really, which would be considered. So the concentration test wouldn't have a, a, as much weight, but other planning factors would still need to be considered and the proposal assessed accordingly. 
Thank you very much, planning. Can I turn to licensing now, <laughs> um, on this, Sorry about this, Chair. Um, in 2008, uh, the, the additional licensing came back. Yes, I think most of us were in this room at the time um, for the Uplands and, and Castle Wards. Um, it, it produced like a, a spike which has been portrayed on, on various graphs as suddenly the HMOs that were already there weren't, you know, suddenly got produced and um, uh, and and things like that. Now the same sort of spike is going to appear now in the St Thomas Ward, isn't it? Because you've got all of these HMOs before which weren't um, light licensable, but now under the additional licensing. What do you expect the volume of HMOs are in in St Thomas that now will have to be licensable now that the additional licensing regime has come into place? Um, I think that this is covered a, a little bit um in the report so with the situation in castle and uplands it was a little bit different because like you said it's a long time ago now but um the before hmo licensing was brought in with the 2004 housing act we had um a registration scheme with special control provisions in castle and uplands so we knew about those properties and they were controlled under the old legislation so there were high numbers and then the legislative controls changed, so they became licensable. Um, gosh, that's a long, it's a long time ago, isn't it? So 2006, that change actually happened, July 2006. Um, the additional licensing scheme has been reviewed and renewed, as you mentioned, several times since then. Situation in St Thomas is different because we didn't have that registration scheme before. So I think in the report chair mention a, a little bit um, towards the beginning of the report, forgive me now, I can't remember the paragraph number, but talk about the work that we'd done in St Thomas to try to um, identify numbers and also look at condition of properties to enable the authority to introduce additional HMO licensing um, in the area and the requirements that were there before the local authority could even consider doing that. So I think it was somewhere around about 70 HMOs that we identified at that time. And at the end of January, we've got 101 licensed HMOs in St Thomas. So whilst um, accepting that there are going to possibly be some that change hands, some that are bought and, and planning consent um, sought for change of use. I think we're probably not far off where we expected to be. Um, as I say, there are some planning, planning, blimey, you got me at it now, sorry, some HMO license applications that are being processed and um, the properties don't appear on the public register until the license is actually granted. So in that interim, whilst they've been processed, it's not public information. Um, the licensing process is not a public consultation in the same way as planning is. So it's uh, say a little bit different. So I expect the number in St Thomas to still increase a little bit from where we're at at the moment. Um, but again, there are some properties that we know of that have got planning permission in St Thomas, but they're not actually then occupied as HMOs. So perhaps speculatively, people will apply for planning consent um, and get that and then not go ahead with that. We know that that happens for all sorts of reasons on all sorts of projects where you know people apply for extensions on properties and then don't go ahead with them. So whilst we will still in, you know continue um processing applications and we'll investigate when we get queries about particular um properties i think at the moment we're probably not 
far off. I stand to be corrected, but I think that's probably yeah. where we're at. I think you said, Paula, you've got 202 licenses currently being considered. Mm. Do you have a, um, a breakdown for that by ward? I don't, but I can. Yeah, you I think that'd be useful. Yeah, that'd be useful to get, give that. an indication then of, yeah. of where they're coming from. They're, they're yeah. a, a mixture of renewal applications, change of use. So a um, new owner has to apply for a new license. So I can right. certainly provide that to yeah, you. Yeah, I think we, yeah. we need to have that distinction as well to actually work out where the new ones are coming in. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. I've got a couple more. Um, on on tab the table in um, 6.9 in the report, I'd like to commend um, the um, HMO team now because it's clear that the number of applications being re received is less than the actual number of licenses granted. So there's um, we, I can I can see good progress being being made there, and it's all tallying up to the total number of licenses. Because bearing in mind we're on a five year cycle, you get an increment every every year on that. So a big pat on the back to that one. That's um, as a happy with that. On um, questions uh, point seven point two um it says i don't know if it's a misprint the additional licensing before the additional licensing scheme ends in february 2026 is is that up for renewal in february 2026 i, I hope well, that's a typo it's not a typo so the um hmo licensing policy that the authority has at the moment is um hmo licensing policy 2020 um, Council adopted that, I think it was November in 2020, um, but that proposed the um, reaffirmation, that's not the correct terminology, but you know, continuing or the renewal of um, additional HMO licensing in Castle and Uplands, which that then subsequently now includes waterfront because of the boundary changes and also Council adopted that to introduce additional licensing in the St Thomas Ward. Legally, after the Council's decision, um, the scheme isn't introduced until three months after Council decision. So the additional licensing scheme came into force, the current one that we've got, came into force on the 15th of February, so tomorrow, um, 2021 and it will last for a maximum of five years. So that's the 2026, but a report will be brought forward for council consideration um, before November 2025. Thank you very much, Paul. I, I can sleep at night now. That was a that was a worry. It was just a, a renewal. And I, I do wish you um, ev every um, every luck with it. You know, the, the continual of staffing, because I, I saw that the, in that in the future challenge and I hope that goes smoothly to carry on the excellent work you're doing. There's just one more question I've got for for um, for, for planning um, with with HMOs and everything like that. Obviously, because uh, comes um, is linked in directly to the proliferation of letting boards. Now, um, as you know, Swansea has had a voluntary code since 2013. Um, other cities, went, uh, you need to, after uh, a voluntary code to do, is it called a direction seven or an article seven direction um, to actually turn this code into a, into a firm law. Now I can see Councillor Hopkins nodding there because um, Irene and myself in the previous term has had, have, have had conversations with him in it. I've also took, carried on the work. I've been banging this one since 2014. Um, um, I've had conversations with the with the chief executive in my sort of monthly audience with him as a group leader. Um, I think where we are, if I'm, if I'm correct, just if you could provide me with an update, is we went out to sell for Wales to try and get somebody to do the work, but nobody turned around and said they wanted to do the work. Um, we've haven't got a resource identified, which doesn't mean we haven't got the cash identified, but we haven't got the capacity identified to carry out the work. We're looking at these. Can we, this has been something that's been rattling on now for about sort of, um, you know, a, a good eight, eight years now. Other cities have done it. Um, it It is something I, I genuinely feel that would help the, you know, the environment of um, areas of high rental properties. Can can we you know now uh, get this prioritised or is you know what is the progress on it and are we moving towards closure on this this long running sore please? 
Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. What I would say, I have tried. As you know, uh, I did find the resources. Um, that resources were limited, to be straight and honest. When uh, we, we did go to Senate Ways, we have looked at doing some, some other ways and means of, of trying to get that work done. It was difficult. We couldn't get anybody. I don't know where the market is up. It could be up to it at the present time. But at the moment, I haven't got the resources, to be straight and honest. I haven't got the financial resources to do that. I will try to look at my budget to see if there is an opportunity and whether I can sit down with yourself and local members and see if we could perhaps look at your local community budget, whether we could do something along that. So I'm willing to look at it, but it, but obviously I'll sit down and discuss it with you. But at the present time, because of the, the situation within financially at the moment, I have not got that resources to hand, but I'm willing to work with you, see if we can identify some funding. One final, if I can sort of come, come back on that, the chief executive inclined to me that the financial resources were there. It was a it was a personnel resource, which was the issue or getting getting someone to do it. But obviously with my with, you know, well, obviously with my fellow um, um, up those group colleagues, we'd love the opportunity to try and progress this because it's something that we feel that would benefit citywide and we would be willing to uh, commit our community budget to assist the matter if that's what's required. Well, maybe we should leave that to David to have a look at and come back to you on that, Peter, OK? Yeah, any no more questions? OK, anybody else got any questions? Uh, Ian, sorry, you want to come in? Just wonder if I could come back on one of Councillor May's earlier questions about properties where they've been refused without um, the concentration test being a, an issue. Um, I'll just have a quick check through. There's four or five I could give you now, or I could email you a list of properties if, if that's easier. Yeah, and is that just because obviously the concentration test includes um, things like sandwiching and one in eight rather than the percentage. We've had them as well, but these are things like residential amenity, parking, those types. Yeah, I can certainly do that. Yeah. OK, hey, right. So thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, that very helpful, very useful session, I think. And uh, I think we've all learned a lot about uh, HMOs. So thank you for that. OK. Right, the next item is going to be the Scrutiny pan Performance Panel Progress Report. And I think uh, Councillor Sue Jones is going to report on, on the Adult Social Services Performance Panel. Sue, do you have anything to add to your report? Thank you, Chair. No, I've got nothing to add to the report other than to thank the staff for all their hard work during the last three years and to look forward to working with them in the future with health and social services working collaboratively. So really nothing more to add. OK, has anybody got any questions for Sue on this report at all? No? OK, thank you, Sue. We shall note that report then. So thank we're going to move much. on now to membership of scrutiny panels and working groups. Um, that, that report in front, just one change to the, uh, the various panels, which is that Councillor Hazel Morris is coming off the Service Improvement and Finance and Development and Regeneration Performance Panels. I understand Hazel's not very well, so we send our best wishes to her and hopefully she'll be back, she'll be back working with us very soon. OK. Nothing else on that report. OK, so I shall now move on to the Scrutiny Work Programme, which is again before you. Just to report that the next meeting we're going to be doing a follow up on the bus services scrutiny working group, which um, given the reports today that the Welsh Government may well be stopping the finances they've got for the buses um, which were put in place. That should be an interesting uh, session and also the audit, the chair of governance and audit will be with us next meeting as well to talk about um, the relationship between our two committees. I'm um, having an extra meeting on the 23rd of March where we're doing pre-decision scrutiny on the national 20 mile per hour default speed limit um, for, the, for the cabinet meeting. We'll be considering that later that week. So anybody got any questions or comments on this report at all? No? OK, thank you. Scrutiny letters are there for information and also the date and time of the upcoming scrutiny panel working group meetings are also there for information. So thank you very much indeed for coming along today. It's been a very good meeting and I declare the meeting closed. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.